So Dave, share a few of your insights before we get into questions and discussion. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, my career has had many uh, twists and turns over the years, um, and I'm delighted to share all of that with you. The last 10 years, uh, I had not been in operating management. I've been doing two things. I've been serving on boards, and I have been teaching um, at this other business school uh, called Wharton, which actually has a campus, fortunately, in San Francisco, so it's convenient for me uh, to teach there. The topic I've been teaching is called Leading Breakthrough Change. And I, the students that I have are um, executive MBAs. They average about 35 years old. They've been working for a dozen years. They're not, they're not startup, early stage MBA students that are 26 or 27. They're all running something. And they don't need to learn how to do incremental change. But breakthrough change is the topic that interests them, and it's the reason why um, our, the class I teach has had such, um, such high demand uh, from the students. <clears throat> uh, I've spent my uh, last 10 years studying this topic, and I spent my whole career engaged in it. And it's the subject we'll talk about today, because breakthrough change is nothing like incremental change. Breakthrough change is really hard. Um, I often thought people would love a change. If we came up with a great new idea, you know, you spend time with your team and you come up with this idea. You know, what's a new marketing idea, new operating efficiency, a new market we can go into, maybe an acquisition, something that's different. It's not the momentum plan. It's something that takes you off the momentum plan. You get excited about it and you're convinced this is a great idea. Everyone's just going to love this and then you share it with them with your great enthusiasm. And they hate it. <laughs> they just hate it. They may tell you they hate it, they may not tell you they hate it, I'm telling you they hate it. Not only that, but halfway through your description of what it is that you're so excited about, they have stopped listening. What are they thinking about? They're thinking, what does this mean to me? Is this good for me, my career? my job, my security, my team. Everything changes, everything changes. So um, the reason I call my book Stacking the Deck is because the reality is companies are built, as you all know, for reliability, consistency, predictability, and risk minimization. That's how they're built. Your processes around budgeting, planning, performance evaluation. They all facilitate those goals. Breakthrough change is none of that. It's the opposite of that. So the processes within the company stack the deck against you. And if you want to be successful, you have to figure out how do we restack the deck to give you a chance to succeed. I can't guarantee it, but I can tell you if you want to improve your chances of success, you need to do a few things that will allow you to succeed. Most of my book, I talk about my various experiences. I interviewed 12 other people uh, who are breakthrough change leaders, both CEOs and middle managers. Um, my experiences in particular come from most of the things I screwed up and did poorly and learned along the way. Uh, most of the time, we were more successful than not. But looking back, I think, my goodness, I could have done all these things so much better mm -hmm. if I would have understood more what I was up against. And, and, and my approach was, it could have been so much better. And so as I thought about that, I thought about all the elements that affect leading change and, and the necessary steps to get there. So that's the, the background for this topic I would share. So we'll, we'll, we'll delve into handling change, Dave. But, but first, let's learn a little bit about, more about you as a leader and your leadership journey. Tell us some of the key events in your leadership journey and some of the people who were important and valuable to you in that journey. OK, sure. So um, uh, I, I started my, my career actually uh, working for the government. Um, and working in healthcare, it's a long story, but I, I managed to make a shift over to financial services. I spent a little time at Citibank. 
uh, a little time in American Express. And then in 1984, I landed at Charles Schwab. And it was a, a company that had just grown from $50 million to $100 million in revenue as a result of its merger with the bank, merger, its acquisition by the Bank of America. So Schwab was a little piece of the B of A. And Chuck had sold the company for one time's revenue at 50 million, $57 million. Um, four years later, we bought the company back from the B of A for $300 million, but that was also one time's revenue. And, uh, and now we own the company, and we had used all kind of leverage to buy the company. So Chuck decided that we would um, uh, do an IPO and pay off all that leverage. I was the head of marketing at this time. Uh, that's what I was hired as, executive VP of marketing. So we took the company public, uh, and market cap was $450 million. Our stock was $16 a share. The market crashed three weeks later. Stock went to $6 a share. We didn't get above $16, $16.50 for four years. Four long years. Devastating years for the employees, the morale, everybody questioning whether the stock would ever return. Um, and the truth of the matter was, having the market go down that much in one day was a was a psychologically devastating effect to our clients, to our customers. This was Black Monday. This was Black Monday, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No one wanted to buy stocks anymore. People, if they were going to participate, they were going to dabble in mutual funds. Well, how many mutual funds did we have? Uh, none. We had none. We had no Schwab funds. We also had a platform of mutual funds, but we charged everybody to buy no-load funds, and nobody wanted to pay to buy a no-load fund. So. Chuck came to us after two years of going absolutely nowhere and saying, look, we can't wait for the market to recover. We have to take this into our own hands. And so we did some things that involved reinventing the company around mutual funds, reinventing the company around independent financial advisors, changing what our branch offices did. Those were the three big initiatives we did at that time. And we did them all relatively poorly, but we managed to get them done mm -hmm. enough for the company to not only get back to its IPO price of 450 million market cap, but to do that go up 10 times in the next seven or eight years. So we got to about a 5 billion market cap uh, in, by, by the mid-1990s. Then the internet came and became our next big challenge. Yep. And um, uh, we were leveraging the internet but we were charging a pretty high price uh, um, for our internet trades. And then these internet-only companies came out, sort of the way Amazon came out to Barnes & Noble. E-Trade and E-Trade, so Ameritrade, yep. others. And suddenly, um, we're doing pretty well, but I'm getting hate mail from our clients saying, why are you charging so much for an online trade? And go to E-Trade for 25 bucks. You're charging me $65. It doesn't feel right. I thought you were about value. What is going on here? Of course, at this time, Schwab's stock price is at the highest it's ever been. We're just killing it. Our employees are getting record bonuses. But I'm getting this mail, and I go to talk to Chuck, and I said, Chuck, I, I don't think we can continue on this path. We, we need to change, because you can't build a great company on the back of unhappy customers. So what do you think we need to do? I said, we need to lower our price. We need to lower our price by more than 50%. He said, well, that's going to devastate us. How will we ever recover? I said, well, we'll get more new customers. We'll lose less customers. We'll get operating efficiencies. We've actually modeled all this out. It'll take two years to get us back to where we were. But the interim, our stock will probably go down 40 or 50%. It's going to be a tough hit. 25% reduction in profitability. But um, Chuck Schwab is one of the world's great entrepreneurs and an immensely courageous man. Always wanted to do the right thing for the customer. He said, Dave, we need to do this. We can't build a company if customers are unhappy. He went to his board. The board approved it. We implemented this plan. Stock got crushed. We got ripped by the analysts. We're a public company. How stupid we are. We didn't have to do this. We jumped the gun. Why did we, why did we take this preemptive move? It was, we're idiots. We got hammered. Stock is down. Didn't take two years to get back to where we were. It took nine months. Mm. Nine months later, our profitability has returned. 
we're now geniuses, we're so smart, look at how you did this. The stock not only recovered the 40% we had lost, it doubled from there, so now we're brilliant. And it just shows how you, you can't measure yourself by the headlines in the paper for sure. Yeah, I do have to share, amplified. absolutely. I have yeah. to share one quick story. Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, my daughter comes home at college at this time. She has some friends with her. One of them comes up to me and says, Mr. Patrick, you went to high school with my mother. I said, what's her name? She said, well, her name used to be Milana Del Monte. I said, yeah, of course I remember her. She would, it would be great to talk to her. Give me the number. So he gives me the number and I call her up. Milana, it's so nice. It's been 20 years. It's so great to talk to you. She says, Dave, it's so great to talk to you. I saw your name in the journal and I, Fortune magazine. It's so great to see how well things are going. What's it like to be Charles Schwab's son-in-law? <laughs> I said, Milana, uh, uh, Chuck and I are not related. I, I, I didn't marry his daughter. We're not related in any way. She, she says to me, well, then, how did you get that job? <laughs> there must have been times when you wished you didn't have oh, it. Yeah, there were times I wished I didn't have it. That came later, but uh, I had to admit to myself, Sheila, that she didn't consider me an intellectual tower of strength in high school. <laughs> she remembered from she school remembered days. me, but yeah. not as an intellectual tower of strength. And in any event, um, things were great. And, and our, our market cap went over $30 billion. Uh, 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 times were fabulous. Um, and then the dot-com implosion happened, and our trading volume just kept coming down from 2000 to 2001, 2, 3, 4. The revenues came down. And I just could not lay off enough people. I laid off uh, 6,000 people. I downsized the company 10,000 people from 25 to 15,000. But my heart was never in that. I was a pretty good growth guy. Mm -hmm. I was a mediocre shrink guy. But that's what the company needed. And I wasn't, at, I wasn't doing a very good job. And uh, the board came to me. I had a board meeting, and I walked in, and uh, Chuck looked me in the eye and said, Dave, we've decided to make a change. I'm sorry, but we want you to resign as the CEO of the company. And I must say, I was devastated by that. I was shocked. I didn't, never saw it coming. But as I looked at it, I thought to myself, yeah, you know, I haven't been, I haven't been doing that great a job at this. This is not, I, I and, and so I've also looked back on that and say, well, what should I have done? Yeah. And, and the key thing that I didn't do was two things. Number one, I didn't know how to do layoffs. I needed to bring in someone to help me. I needed to bring in people who know, who know how to do that. And, and one of my principles about leading breakthrough change is the quality of your team. And number one, you need a team that knows how to do what you're trying to do, that maybe isn't doing this for the first time, that whatever it is, they've been there and they've got some sense of it. Not a bunch of hardworking, dedicated people. It's not good enough. Mm -hmm. You need people who know what they're doing. Yeah. I didn't have anyone on my team who really know how to, knew how to do layoffs the right way. And we didn't bring in consultants, we just tried to do it ourselves, and we, we, we fumbled, we fumbled. You'd been a team for growth. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And secondly, um, everybody picks off the, lives off of the passion of the CEO. You've gotta come every day and recognize everyone is watching you. They're taking their inspiration from you. You have to understand that. That's, I mean, that's part of this job. You show up, you have to have a look on your face, a, an air of determination, a, a, a sense of confidence that you know what has to be done. I, didn't, I don't think during that period I had, I had any of that. I was floundering. And so I think the board knew they, that they had to make a change. And in my heart of hearts, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, uh, I didn't feel like they were making a huge mistake. I was deeply disappointed. I think when looking back, I wish they would have kicked me in the head six months earlier and said, here's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the way it always works. Yeah. And so that was a very, very tough uh, part of my career. Yeah. Boards tend to make certain decisions about mm -hmm. CEOs without a lot of signaling yeah. and, and yeah. coaching. One quick question, Dave, before we de delve into this question about change. You were with Schwab for over 20 years. Right. Um, do you recommend that kind of commitment because it prepared you for one kind of leadership but not for the other side of the, yeah. of the well, slope. Well, I mean, here's what's interesting. So, so I was at Schwab for 20 years, but during that time, 
we went from a $50 million revenue company to a $5 billion revenue company. And, and my view, point of view is every time you double in size, the company is like a different company. The, 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 the sophistication of their processes have to change. You go from 50 to 100, 100 to 200 to 300, 300 to 600, 600 to a billion. Things are changing. The company is like a different company. So in terms of my learning, I was experienced in learning great things. Um, but as the company got bigger, I no longer had some of the mentors I wish I would have had. I, I was figuring out it out as I went along. And uh, I had great mentorship in my time at Citibank. And so for a long time, I thought to myself, uh, the guy I worked for at Citibank, was named, his name was Dick Kovacevic. He went on to become the CEO of Wells Fargo, probably the best bank leader in the United States at that moment in time. And I used to think, what would Dick do? What would, how would Dick, you know, what did I learn from Dick and how would I, how would I take what he taught me and try to, try to do something with it? Um, but uh, I, I, think it, I think it's situational. I think um, you have to always be learning and growing. And you can't always do that on your own. Sometimes you need someone that you can model and you can look at and say, I want to take something from each of these people. Um, and usually, early in your career, you have to look up and say, can I learn something from the people I'm working for? Can the people above me teach me? Yeah. And I was very lucky in my time at, at um, American Express and my time at Citibank. There were people above me I learned a lot from. And then I sort of um, le leveraged that for the next 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. So it worked for me until it didn't. Yeah. Um, I think for young people, I, I don't think you know. I don't think you can sit in a situation that's not growing, where where it's not where you you don't feel like you're growing, you're not learning, and you can't just sit there and hope it gets better. You got to take it's your career. You got to take charge of it, and 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 be the the CEO of your career. Mm -hmm. Which which brings us right back to change. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you talk about change, you talk about detecting the faint signals, mm -hmm. the signals of why you need to change, when you need to change, how you need to change, and I guess who you need to change. Right. So right. share with this group a little bit about what, what do you mean by that, and, and how, how can we all be better at detecting those faint signals? So I don't care what, where you are in the corporate hierarchy. If you think you can do your job sitting in your office and reading reports coming across your desk, you can't, okay? You have to get out and you need to be talking to the front line. You need to be talking to the lowest level person in the company. They know what's going on more than anyone else. They understand what works and doesn't work in your operations, in your technology, in your processes, in your risk management. You need to not only talk to the people you normally talk to, you gotta dig down and talk to other people. You gotta talk to your customers. You have to be out asking customers. And you don't talk to your customers. Here's what I see all the time. People say, they meet with customers, how'd it go? Oh, very well, customers love us. what they yeah. say? They said they loved us. What did you ask them? Are you happy with what we do? Said, That's not what you asked them. Right. Well, what do you ask them? Well, in the last year, how did we disappoint you and how did we delight you? Tell me a story of each. Do you biz do business with any of our competitors? If so, what do they do that we ought to be doing? I call these high gain questions. You don't ask a question where the customer can tell you, you guys are wonderful, I love you. That's not, because people are polite, that's what they'll want to say oftentimes. Not always, I mean, we are here in <laughs> Chicago and I do give talks in New York and they're not always uh, all that polite. But, but, but um, you're in a social setting, you're meeting with customers, they don't necessarily want to tell you what you don't really want to hear unless you make it clear that you do. And you ask these questions. What's, what, here's the question I like the best. Close your eyes, lose reality, and tell me what would delight you the most. Don't worry whether it's practical or not. What would delight you? What would make your socks go up and down if we could do something like X? What would be a breakthrough in terms of the way we work together, that would be amazing, amazing, right? And it's not the customer's job to find the solution, it's your job to find the solution, but it's their job to explain to you the need. Mm -hmm. What's the need that you don't know about? Mm 
Which takes you right to innovation. Right. So that takes you to the what. Mm -hmm. The how is your job. The how and the who. And, and so when, when I think about leading breakthrough change and, 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 and difficult innovation, um, I believe that, number one, you need to have a style of leadership that will inspire, not just motivate. Number two, you need um, the right team operating the right way. And number three, you need a step-by-step -step process. And that process not only has to build momentum, it has to build a perception of momentum. Because if the project is seen to be succeeding, people gravitate toward you. They want to be a part of it. They want to help you. They want to be, a, they want to be on board. If the project is seen as failing, they back away. They want no part of it. They, want, they don't want to rub up anywhere near the project. And these things become self-fulfilling prophecies. So you have to be thinking about not just the lagging indicators, the, the P and L, which are the lagging indicators. What are the leading indicators? What are the things you need to measure early that give you some sense of whether you're starting to succeed that you can wrap your arms around and promote within your team and beyond your team so this perception of momentum can be built. It's absolutely critical. People think about, do we have momentum? How about the perception of momentum, mm -hmm. which I think is so important. So you were making a distinction in what you just said, Dave, between inspiration and motivation. Mm -hmm. let's, let's dig into that a little bit. What, what do you see as the difference? And what constitutes inspiration, if that's preferable to motivation? Well, you know, we use these words interchangeably all the time. Inspiration, motivation, as if they're the same thing. And they're really different. I would imagine we all went to college. Probably most of us studied psychology. We remember this guy, Maslow, hierarchy of needs. Motivation, the exchange of behaviors for rewards, right? Behaviors for rewards. Well, the reality is, when you're leading breakthrough change in a company, when you're, when you're taking on some really tough project, in my experiences, the rewards are not sufficient for the time and energy and career risk associated with that project. They're just not. I mean, in a startup company, they might be. But in a, in a big company, if you're asked to take on some really tough tough project, That's a big risk. You, might get, you might get a bonus, you might get some kind of reward, but really, you gotta do it because you think it's important and worthy of your time, your energy, you're gonna learn, you're excited by the challenge. So that to me is what inspiration, inspiration is about wanting, pe wanting to be part of something great, wanting to do something worthwhile, wanting to build something, create something, change something, because it needs to be done and you're inspired to want to be a part of that. And that's the job of the leader. The job of the leader is not just to motivate, but to, be ins to inspire, to be that kind of an inspirational leader. And, and to me, when people say, okay, fine, well, how do you do that? To me, that's all about authenticity. That's all about being an authentic leader. And so when you ask the next question, <laughs> which is, okay, how do you do that? How do you become that authentic leader? You need people to understand who you are and what made you what you are. What are your values? The biggest, the biggest driver of satisfaction is the alignment of values between an individual and the company and an individual and their supervisor. Are our values aligned? Do we care about the same things? Mm -hmm. And so, as a leader, you need to spend the time to reveal yourself. You need to be willing to tell people who you are, what you stand for, the experiences that you've had. You can't do this by reading a script. You have to do it from the heart, authentically, in the moment. People follow people. They don't really follow ideas. They follow people. You have to be worthy of followership. And everyone's figuring that out. Are you worthy of my followership? Do I believe in you? Do I believe you can get us there? Do you excite me? Do you inspire me? And so that's a high hurdle. 
That's a high hurdle. But I don't think you can get these kind of projects done unless you're willing to step up to that challenge. And it, it, for some people, it comes more naturally than others. Um, but it's, I, I don't know any other way to do it. So that alignment between values and the, the, the business, is that something that Chuck Schwab was able to communicate? Is that something that inspired you and was an inspiration that you could develop for others? Well, you know, Chuck and I were immensely different people. And I learned so much from Chuck. And, and, and it's interesting. So Chuck is dyslexic. It's well known. He's, he's put a foundation together to fund research into d dyslexia. But when I joined Schwab back in the 80s, nobody knew Chuck was dyslexic. And he never told anybody. It was a secret. Okay, it was a, it was a handicap, and he didn't know who wants to tell everybody you're handicapped. So Chuck kept that very secret, and he never liked to get up and give speeches, never liked to get up and give speeches, and the, and uh, one of the reasons for that was he was actually really bad at it. But there was an authenticity to this guy. Mm -hmm. He cared about customers. He really wanted to do the right thing. He. He, he, the business proposition of who we were and what we did, what we stood for, it, money was, the, when I first joined the company, he would talk to me, he said, money's the byproduct of doing great things. We're, we're going to make a lot of money, Dave, but it's the byproduct. If we focus on our customers, if we focus on helping them succeed, helping them invest, helping, helping them succeed with their money, everything will follow. And, and that inspired me. But I, but when I first um, uh, became in charge of the branch offices, and I tried to get Chuck to get up and talk about this. He couldn't do it. He could not do it. He, he, he refused to read a speech. He, he was awful at it. He'd stumble around because he couldn't read. He had a hard time reading. So finally, this is how I got him to do it. This is, I said, Chuck, here's what we'll do. You know these conversations we have that are always so great? Let's have a conversation. I'll get you. And, and so we'd have a room full of, it could be thousands of Schwab people, and I would just interview them and get him to speak from the heart, just like you and I are doing, Sheila. Mm -hmm. and, and the guy was so authentic that it was fantastic. And, and, I, and that's where I started to learn about, it wasn't, as, it wasn't about how polished your words are. It was about how from the heart they are. So what was your style of inspiration that you brought to the company, given that, that you and Chuck Schwab were quite different in, in style? Well, I was um, very comfortable um, speaking before um, groups of people. I, I don't suffer from stage fright. Um, but I always thought that great leaders um, really read great speeches, that, that they, they, uh, they have these speeches written by fabulous speech writers that, that put their words together into these beautiful messages, right? So when I got hired to be the, the, the president of Schwab, um, and I realized I was going to have to start giving a lot of speeches, I, uh, I looked for a speechwriter to help me write these speeches. And I hired this guy, Terry Pierce. And uh, we have our first session. I said, Terry, I have to give a speech to about 250 branch managers in a month. And here are the things I want to talk about. I'd like you to write this up into just a fabulous speech that I can deliver that will be, will be great. And that's what I had always seen at Citibank. John Reed, he read speeches. And Walter Riston, they read speeches. That's what they did. So Terry said, well, Dave, um, uh, before we get to that, I want to learn more about you. I want to learn who you are. I want to learn about the experiences that have made you who you are, blah, blah, blah. I said, Terry, I don't want a biography. Maybe we're off on the wrong foot here. I'm not interested in a biography. I want a speech. Just write a speech on these topics. And he said, Dave, that's, that's, that's really not how I work. That's not how I do this. Um, I, I think it's about who you are as a person. I need to, he, he talked to me about this authentic leadership thing that I had never really thought about before. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't want you reading a speech. You're not going to read a speech. You're going to work from notes. That's no problem. We can give you a series of notes. But then you speak from the heart. We don't read speeches. And he said, I want you to trust me on this. And I did. And, and suddenly I realized that people don't remember what you said. They remember how you made them feel. That's the important thing. 
How did you make them feel? Did you excite them? Did they get inspired? Did they want to be a part of it? Did they have confidence in you and your leadership to take them to the next level? And that doesn't come from reading a speech. It also comes, the most, one of the most important parts of the whole thing is the Q&A session you do with your employees. Because right. there's nothing scripted about that. And they know it. And they see it as an opportunity to test you, to test your ideas, to see what you're made of, to see the depth of your conviction. And, and it's an opportunity to really uh, deliver on that authenticity that people are so hungry for today. They're so hungry for it. They don't see it hardly anywhere. It's really interesting that you say that. And, and for those of you who were in the earlier programs, um, we're now incorporating in the current program a piece on how you tell stories, how you convey in a, in a personal way the message that you're, the business message that you're trying to deliver, but, but as, a, as a story rather than as a script. Right. I want to pick up on something else you said, Dave, and I think there's something behind it, so let's explore it. You kind of implied that having a hard-working team is not enough. Mm -hmm. So dig behind that a little bit, if you would. Well, um, uh, so I'm a great believer in teamwork. I understand the power of teamwork is very, very powerful. And um, I, I, I must admit that um, there were times in my career I wasn't that great of a team player myself. I, I had to learn uh, uh, how to do that um, most effectively, uh, probably another story. But, but um, what I've learned is a team pulling together is immensely important. And it doesn't happen automatically. In fact, the opposite is true. The, 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 uh, the normal state of things is that teams are pulling somewhat together and somewhat against each other. And if you want to get the team to pull together, you have to invest time and energy to do that. And, and, oh, and I would recommend, there's a fabulous book. I recommend it. It's by an author named Patrick Lencioni. He's written a whole bunch of great books, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Anyone here have, have read it? Some of you have? Easy read, simple principles, very powerful, and I'm a great believer in his whole hierarchy of, of trust and everything else that comes above that that forms uh, the foundation for good teams. However, um, a hardworking team of people who don't have the right experience is not going to get you there. Mm -hmm. And I believe if you want to be a great leader, um, and a successful, growing executive, you need to be a magnet for talent your entire career. You need to always be, every time you go to a meeting, you're building your network so that the next time you have a need, you're thinking about who would fill that need and where am I going to find that person. And you're always recruiting. You're always gathering business cards and meeting people and staying in touch and dripping on people that have impressed you the most because maybe someday you'll have the right opportunity for them. Um, I, I often see people, they'll take the best guy they have and they'll give him a job that is outside of his skill level. As I think about all of you, you, you follow, follow with me on the, follow, on the following question, okay? So how many of you, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of you have someone on your team who's struggling, who's not making it, who, uh, who's not quite living up to what has to be done, and you're trying to help them. You're trying to, to, to teach them, to help them grow, to give them time. And in my experience, 99% of the time, they're not going to get there. If you're, if you're working in a company that's evolving and changing and the demands are getting bigger and tougher and who isn't working in a company like that, that person who's struggling, you're going to have a conversation with them a year from now that you actually should have had right now. Here's the catch. Here's the catch. The people under them are all struggling. The people on the side of them are all struggling and they're wondering when you're going to do something about it. And you need to act sooner. I, I was in a situation like this uh, uh, 10 years ago, and, and, and Jack Welch and I 
were on the stage together, and I was talking about this. And, and Jack said to me, Dave, you know, I look back on my career, and at the time I was younger, Jack was older, was still in that relationship, but he's, he's, he's uh, more experienced than I am, obviously. He said to me, Dave, I look back, I never, knew, I never moved too fast. I always moved too slow. I look back, that was my mistake. I always moved too slow. I said, Jack, I, I, I'm sure I'm doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm moving too slow. And I'm telling all of you, you're moving too slow. Mm -hmm. If you have someone who's not making it, you've tried and they're not making it, what are you waiting for? They're not going to make it and you're gonna to have to have that difficult conversation down the road. And this is what, this is our job. Our job is to be a recruiter, figure out where the people are going to come from, and, and be the developer of the quality team we need, that the teamwork is good, but each individual is as good as you can get them to be. And, and um, we are the product of our team. Yeah. I mean, we don't do this alone. None of this gets done by ourselves. And, and so you, you need to be, you need to be um, tough-minded about this. And, I look back and I made so many mistakes in this and I, I, I wish I didn't. Me too. <laughs> One more question, then I'm gonna throw it open to all of you. You referenced a process for breakthrough change. Mm -hmm. Is it your view that there's only one process to follow or are there all kinds of different ways in which you can get breakthrough change? Well, so I mentioned earlier that most of the time I didn't do what was in my book. <laughs> and I succeeded somewhat in spite of myself. But when I look back, I think there's, I think there's a, pretty, a better way of doing it. And what I've tried to outline in my book is my experience of, of a recommended way. If you're going to skip steps, or you're gonna reorder the steps, that's fine. Uh, you're gonna add things, that's fine. But at least now you have this framework a framework of a process that builds momentum and a perception of momentum. That's the fundamental and builds the quality of the team. So let me just give the, the broad strokes here. So you start with understanding the need to change. You have to, you as in you, need to understand the need to change and have a sense of urgency around that need. If you don't have urgency, it's, not, it's just not gonna happen. It's so hard, you have to realize what do we need to do and why do we need to do it now? You need to be answer, able to answer those questions. Then you need to bring together that inner circle of people who are gonna help you figure it out. You may not have everyone you need, but you need a group that's gonna help you, and with them, you develop this vision of the future. You don't have a plan yet, but you have broad strokes of what it's gonna look like, where are we going, and why are we going there? And the minute you do that, and you start to communicate it, because as you go from this vision to a plan, you start to bring more people into the process. You bring people from finance, you bring people to help you do the plan. The plan is, is a broader set of people getting involved. Well, the minute you start doing that, you start getting resistance. Resistance starts that soon. And you need to be thinking, where's that resistance gonna come from? So you start to need, you need to anticipate, are we running into the, the culture of the company? Have we never been an international company? Everybody believes we should be domestic, and now we're gonna go international, and everybody's gonna see all the reasons we shouldn't do that, whatever it's gonna be. And so we have to think about cultural barriers, we have to build a plan, we have to model the plan, build the economics, we gotta look at the talent we need, do we have all the talent? We have to think about the metrics, the leading and lagging indicators. Um, and then finally we have to think, are there some things that we can test? Can we prototype? Mm -hmm. Can we do, can we, can we fail small? Can we fail small and fail quick? One of the things I, I talk about in my book is the, is the concept of noble change. People used to say to me, Dave, is it okay to fail? And I would say, well, um, sometimes it's okay to fail. I mean, if it's never okay to fail, nobody would ever take a, a, take a risk. So it's gotta be sometimes okay to fail, but it's not always okay to fail. And they asked me, well, okay, so can you put a little dimension in that? Can you tell me what it means? When is it okay and when is it not okay? So I developed this idea called noble failure where there are certain rules, and if you follow these rules, if you, if you model the change, if you do your contingency plans, if you fail small, if you protect your downside, you don't have regulatory risk, you try to prevent reputational risks, you certainly don't have a financial calamity on your hands, then if you fail, okay, we learn from that experience. Mm -hmm. You don't get rewarded, but you, your professional life stays intact. We're gonna have some failures. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I think those are the kind of things I spelled out. I'm going to open it up to all of you now on this topic that I'm guessing that there's everyone in the room has been in a situation where they thought incremental change would do it and came to the conclusion that something needed breakthrough change. So this is something that all of you have, have been faced with. Questions for Dave. Mark? It comes the microphone. Oh, sorry. Have you ever rewarded somebody? Because at, at the end there you said they failed, so we didn't reward. What about rewarding people that are showing the right behavior to take that risk to drive change? And even though they failed, it's the behavior that you. Yeah. Reward. No, I think I think that um, I think if people fail. They, I mean, it's e especially in the world like of new products and markets and things of that nature where you don't know for sure. You can do all the right things, but the project can still fail. Can you reward someone? Yeah, you can reward someone for being a pioneer. They've certainly learned a lot. Um, uh, and they took risks, career risks, personal risks, put time and energy in. If they've done all the right things, um, but I wouldn't guarantee that. I want people to feel like they've got to succeed uh, or, or, or it's um, uh, not the end of my career, but I want to succeed. I, w I want to win. I want to win and I want to succeed for the company. So um, I think you can, you can reward people even if things don't go as well as you hope. I really like that phrase, noble failure, because it, it implies that there's something larger, that there's something to be learned for the whole organization. Yeah, and, and you, want, you want people to be willing to take some risks mm -hmm. and to do new things, uh, but you want them to do it in a, in, a, in a structured, thoughtful, prudent way. So there needs to be some rules around what makes noble failure, and I laid those out. Thanks, Mark. Good question. There are others out there. I know there are. This is not a shy group. Pat. Could you just wait for the mic? Just make sure everyone can hear you. David, you said when the board made the decision they were going to make a move, you didn't see it coming. So, and you were in a period of disruption and change. Was the next CEO ready that you were grooming? How did you think about succession planning in this type of an environment? Well, so when I said that um, I didn't see it coming, um, I had, I had actually talked to Chuck at the beginning of the year. And I said to him, you know, we've had three tough years. We have not had profitability recover. We've had a series of downsizings. I, I don't think I'm getting this right. Uh, the mar you know, Wall Street seems to be becoming increasingly uh, impatient. And uh, this is a big year for us, Chuck. You know, I, if, if, I don't, if I don't get the, if we don't get this right, if we don't get this right, um, I wouldn't be surprised if, you, you, you start hearing people looking for a change in leadership. He said to me, oh no, Dave, we'd never, you've been here 20 years, that, you're my guy, that's never gonna happen. Um, so in that sense, I thought I still had the board's confidence. Um, and so it was um, a shock to me that I had lost that and no one had told me that that was even happening. Um, what happened was there was no immediate successor. I had a couple of different people that I thought were groomable into becoming the CEO. Chuck stepped back in the job, so he became the CEO again, because I had been the CEO for a couple of years. Chuck returned to be the CEO, and uh, he took our chief financial officer and effectively had him run the company. Uh, and Chuck was like the visionary, big picture guy, and Chris, Chris Dodds, ran the company for a couple of years. And then um, we, or they groomed another one of my guys who is uh, there today as the CEO, uh, whose name is Walt Bettinger. So they were both in the, in the company uh, working for me when, uh, when I was terminated. Good question, Pat, thanks. Toma. Dave, thanks again for being here. Uh, my question is around the cadence with your team. So driving disruptive changes, uh, most of the time it's not a straight line. There is, there is some momentum and then there are some you know, noble failures. So as a CEO, 
what was your cadence with your team and with the rest of the organization when you talk about when you win and when there is a noble failure? So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, the burden on you as CEO, as leader of the effort, is nothing short of enormous. Oftentimes, it is the grit and determination of the CEO or the project leader that keeps the thing going. I mean, when I interviewed these dozen people for my book, that topic came up over and over and over again, how lonely it can be because things will not go well all the time. We know that. We know that we have a plan, but things are gonna go off plan. We're gonna need to adjust. We have to have that kind of flexibility. That's why things like corporate budget systems and all that don't work very well. We, we don't know exactly. We're going down this route, and we're gonna have to make some adjustments along the way, and if something stalls, and we're all told we're fa we've, we have failed as opposed to we're struggling and need to get back on track, then that will kill the momentum in the project and kill the project. So we have to have this contract with whoever we report to that this is not gonna be a straight line, but it's worth the effort. It's worth it to make the effort, but you, as the leader, let's assume the CEO in this case, or the division president, whatever that leader is, your grit and your determination, your ability to stay positive, your ability to project a positive atmosphere of confidence is the difference between succeeding and failing. Everybody looks to you, it's a big deal. It's hard as hell, but that's what comes with this job. That's why everybody can't do it. It is not just for the smart, hardworking guy. It is for people who have the ability to step up and realize every day they show up with their game face on, ready to go, and ready for everyone to suck energy off of you. You've got to be willing to be that guy. Mm -hmm. Elliot. Hello. Yep. So, so Dave, could you speak to some of the differences between leading bold change in a big entity like, like Schwab compared to smaller innovative companies and some of the misconceptions uh, that you've um, learned in your career about how people think about leading change into very different corporate environments? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I I interestingly enough, I, I mean, I saw it from both vantage points in Schwab. When I first joined Schwab, it was a $100 million revenue company. There were a few hundred people there. It was pretty small. Um, and, and then you know, when I left, we were a Fortune 500 company. So I, I saw it from, from, dif from different vantage points. The, the level of um, time, energy, and discipline that you put in in a big company is very different than in a little company. In a little company, I don't want to say the, the plan for bold change is on the back of a napkin, but it, it's not, it's, it's outlined, it's structured, you're thinking about the biggest risks. It might be a couple of sheets of paper. It's not, it's not very detailed. It, it, it's modeled, but it's not modeled the way it is in a big company. Um, and so, uh, in some ways, it's, it's, uh, it's easier because there isn't as much institutional resistance, but it's harder because the resources are so limited. And there's more on you as the leader. There's more on you as the leader. In a bigger company, you have to have the patience to go slow, to go fast. I didn't make that line up. That was one of my, one of my co colleagues at Schwab once said that to me, and I loved it, and I've been using it for 20 years. You have to go slow to go fast. I'm an impatient guy. I want to get rolling. But getting rolling before I've thought it through, before I've laid it out, before I've built my support, before I've, I, sometimes you got to talk to people who you know are going to be the negative people mm -hmm. because they're going to help you. Yep. I mean, it's hard for me to go to those people who I know are gonna see all the reasons not to do it. 
They're going to suck my energy and my enthusiasm. But I can learn from them. They can tell me the things I need to think about. So whether I want to go in there or not, I'm going in there. I'm going to talk to them because it's going to help. It's going to prevent me from failing. And I'm motivated enough that I'm going to go through whatever I have to go through to find that stuff out. And I'm going to shut up and I'm going to listen <laughs> to stuff I really don't want to hear. But that's what you have to do. You have to go slow and get input and talk to people and lay out the plan and start to bring people with you on board, build some support, the things I talked about in my book. And, and then once we have it organized and we have the team together and we have the energy and we've answered the questions, then we can go like hell. Well, then you've got the momentum. Exactly. Then you've yeah. built something. Yeah. So, but for me, it was, I wanted to rush out. I mean, I come up with an idea. I'm ready to go implement it. I mean, I have like zero patience. But I, I surrounded myself with people who would slow me down. And that was, that was part of the magic of this team we had that was so successful. Other questions? Yes. Thanks for being here. Um, quick question. One of the things I admire about Schwab is that obviously it's a very mission and um, mission driven company, strong culture. Right. And I think back to your comments towards the start that obviously as a company grows, one of the challenges you have, especially if it's founder driven and there's been a team that's been there a while, is that team is you know, strongly associated with the culture and the mission of the firm. And yet there is a need to start bringing in people with new and different expertise as the firm grows. So how do you balance the reality that that can sometimes get you off track from you know, your founding mission and, and, and the culture of the firm um, with the reality that you do need to grow to, and keep kind of growing to attract the right kind of talent? It's kind of yeah. a fine balance. Yeah. So um, Schwab was started in 1974. We sold the company to B of A in 84, which went public in 87, didn't get past our IPO price for four years. I told you that story. So in 1992, we're starting to grow again. And we're hiring a lot of new people. And I went to Chuck and I said, Chuck, we, we need to write down the, the sort of mission of the company. We need to write down your vision for our company. We need to write down the values that we live by. He said, Dave, we don't need to write any of that down. Everybody knows it. I said, how do they know it, Chuck? He says, I've told them. I said, Chuck, we have 4,000 employees. Forgive me, but you haven't talked to all 4,000 employees. I know this. <laughs> There's like 20 of us you talk to. We've got to write this stuff down so we can share it with all the people that we're hiring. They know who we are and what we stand for, what you believe in, so we can use it also as a litmus test to make sure we're hiring people who are aligned with this vision and these values. And so... Um, uh, we had this opportunity, I, I'm, uh, Elliot's here, he's the CEO of Hightower, company that I'm the chairman of, and we've been working on it for seven years, he's been working on it for eight or nine years. Um, and a few years ago, we, we sat down with our leadership team and went through that same process. At about the same time, we said, we need to write down the values, who, who we are and what we stand for, and we need to write them down. We need to have words that we can share that these are the things that matter to us. And we have to live by these things. So my, my suggestion is you need to become explicit. And it's, by the way, it's not easy. It took a leadership team a whole day to figure out what are the guiding principles we have and what are the words that bring that all to light, that we're willing to be held accountable, that this is the culture we want to build. Culture is an immensely important ingredient in successful companies. All the successful companies I've studied or I've ever looked at have very strong cultures, and they have a culture that is intentional. It doesn't just happen. It was by design. Someone guided the culture to be what they wanted it to be. So I would encourage you to think along those lines. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. Okay. Sure. A really great question, I'm sure. I hope it's a great question. Um, <laughs> no when you think about your topic of breakthrough change and disruption, etc., when you look out in the landscape, let's take a small company and then take a large company, 
what do you point to? Like when you, when you think about all the work you've done, the studying you've done the last 10 years around this topic, and then you watch the world and things are happening, what are some recent transformations or recent turnarounds or recent restructurings of businesses that you've seen that you said, wow, that role modeled everything I believed? Well, you know, not everybody knows this. I don't know if you've read Howard Schultz's book on Starbucks. And, uh, I think it's called um, his most recent book. On, no, it's not called Onward. Anybody remember what his book is called? Um, I can't remember the title of it right now. But uh, it was about the turnaround at Starbucks and how he engineered that turnaround. And I read and he that. he came back in to do it. And he came back in. And I read the book. And, and, and he was very clear on what was going wrong and what he needed to do to change, to change the culture back to valuing the things that were important. And I look at that company that's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and continues to grow. And I know the law of large numbers makes it really hard to grow and they continue to grow and they continue to innovate. And I'm a customer and I keep seeing the new products and the new things they're doing. The new, he, he told me, Dave, at any moment in time, we have 50 tests we're doing, 50 new products, new stores, new ways of doing business. They just came out with, I, I, I have an app on my phone now. Not only can I charge my, my drink, I can order my drink on the app and go in the store and pick it up. It's waiting for me. By the time I walk to Starbucks, there it is waiting for me. Hopefully it's not cold, but it's waiting for me. So um, I think the turnaround at, at, at Starbucks is, um, is one of those stories that I was, I was close to. And uh, uh, John Donahoe is the CEO of eBay. And when he, when he went in as president, uh, at that moment in time, they were really struggling. Their, their initial model was, was losing speed, losing steam. And here's the thing he told me that was really interesting. He said, Dave, the team we had was really proud of what had been built. And what had been built was not continuing to win. People were copying us. Yeah. So, so we were losing momentum. And the team that had built what we were wasn't able to give up what we were to go to the next place. And I had to replace all of them. And interestingly, when they, they were all talented people, mm -hmm. but they couldn't get there inside of eBay. And when they went to a new, when he got, he, so he, he basically let them all go in a, in a process of some sort. They, they, they left the company. He said, Dave, they all went on to be successful in a new place because they're really good people, but they couldn't change what they had built. What happens is people build something new and then they start protecting what they've built as opposed to giving up on what they've built and go to the new thing. And I look back and I think to myself, maybe I was guilty of that at Schwab too. Maybe that was what I was struggling with in the 2000 era when I couldn't change the company fast enough to where we needed to go to become the high margin, low growth company that was going to succeed in that kind of an environment. So John had to change all those people. He got a new team in and that team succeeded and took eBay, I think 5X from where he started uh, over the next couple of years. That's a, a good caution for us all and a, and a great note on which to end. I want you to join me in thanking Dave Potrock for his comments. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.